Hi everybody, I hope you're well, thank you very much for joining the live chat. Um, can I just see a few thumbs up if you can hear me? We had a couple of uh, technical issues, so please just give me a little thumbs up if you can hear me, or an ear emoji or something like that, or just say, yes, we can hear you. That'd be really good. Is that a thumbs up for saying, yes, you can hear me? Who can hear me? Fantastic. Okay, I'm going to assume you guys can hear me. This is great. Um, so, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name is Ross, and I uh, am created the Daily Jaws. And um, today is the 43rd anniversary of Jaws, the greatest movie uh, ever made. I think we all agree. <laughs> and uh, tonight is a very, very special night because um, it's not just the 43rd anniversary of the movie, but we're also being joined by one of the key elements of the success of that movie, uh, Mr. Carl Gottlieb, um, the screenwriter of the movie. So it's a really exciting time. Um, I've had a very quick chat with Carl before the interview, and he's really excited. This is the first time he's ever been uh, live on the net. Um, he's never done an interview quite like this before, so it's a first for him as well. So we're very, very pleased and very honoured um, that he can be with us tonight. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to just tell you a little bit about Carl before I invite him to come and join the conversation. Um, I did some research on Carl um, in preparation for the interview and I tell you what, it's incredible what Carl has achieved in his career. I'm going to read you through some of the things that, that he has done. It's genuinely incredible. Um, so Carl's credits include The Odd Couple, he was a writer on that before he went to Jaws, Saturday Night Live, The Jerk, obviously the Steve Martin classic, uh, Caveman, which is a fantastic movie which Carl wrote and directed, so if you haven't seen that, definitely check it out. Oh, I'm being told I'm low, so I'm going to turn it up a little bit. Hopefully that will make things a little clearer. Um, so as I was saying, Carl has been involved in some absolutely incredible movies, um, including The Jerk, Caveman, which is something that he directed and uh, wrote himself. Um, he was also in MASH as well, he had a, a cameo part in that. And he's worked with some of the creme de la creme in terms of Hollywood. Um, Richard Pryor, Steve Martin, uh, Donald Sutherland, Elliot Gould, Richard Dreyfuss and obviously Steven Spielberg when they worked together on Jaws. He's also Golden Globe and BAFTA nominated for the screenplay in Jaws as well. So it's a very, very high caliber guy we're talking about. So I saw that he did pop up online. Um, and just before we go to uh, Carl Live, um, I just wanted to give a shout out to our sponsor, uh, Buster Browns, who have been stringing up Paint Happy Bastards since 1975. And that joke was courtesy of Steve Joyner. Thank you very much, Steve. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to try and find Carl now, and I'm going to invite him. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. You, you do have to be a little louder, though, I think. Oh, sorry. It's 2 a.m. here in the, in the UK, so I'm trying to keep it quiet. But um, can you hear me now okay? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you fine. Perfect. Thank you. Carl, thank you so much for taking the time out to, uh, to join us. How are you? Happy, happy to be here, and thanks for, you know, leading me through this technological thicket to the point where we're both on a split screen talking to you. <laughs> it's amazing what technology can do. Obviously, I'm here in England. You're sort of all the way in Hollywood and LA. Um, we've asked our community lots and lots of questions, uh, things that they want to find out from you. So um, we've got a real mixed bag of questions, some real curveballs, but some really good ones as well that we'll be going through in a moment. Um, the first question, though, obviously, is today is the 43rd anniversary of Jaws. Um, could you take us back to that day, back in 1975, when the movie first came out? You know, what were you doing? Were you at a premiere? What were you up to sort of 43 years ago today? Great question. I think I was yelling at my publisher in New York that the Jaws log should be in the bookstores today, not July 6th, which was the official drop date for the uh, the book, which was written during the 
year, you know, 74 to 75, between the time the film was finished and the time the film debuted, I also wrote The Jaws Log, which yeah. although I can't, I can't see it in my half of the split screen, but you should be able to see it over my head. You see the uh, poster behind me? Uh, the way that the screen works, it kind of cuts out the top part. So we can see your, your chair, so you're nice and clear on the yeah. screen. So I, I, um, I, Perhaps I have to go a little wider. Let me see. Uh, yeah, have a go. Whoops. <laughs> oh, spin the camera. That's it. Yes, we can just about see the jaws log. Well, and we will, I, I, we will I can see that. what I have to do. Hold on. I'll be right back. <laughs> you can watch me moving around in the background. This is a Carl Gottlieb exclusive, guys. Satisfy all the requirements. Yeah, this is live TV, guys. <laughs> well, yeah, if it wasn't live, it would be posed and artificial. Mm. <laughs> now you're getting the back of a scruffy chair. But when I come back, I'll be in it. You should see. We could just about see the book. If you spin your camera around just a touch, we can see it. Oh, yeah. Let's see, let's see. There we are. Perfect. Thank you. Awesome. Um, okay, so 43 years ago, you were yelling at your publisher. Can you believe that it's 43 years since Jaws came out? No, I, you know, it, it's hard to believe that it's been as many years as it has been since I was born. I mean, the, the, <laughs> uh, uh, you do stuff and then you keep doing stuff and then more stuff happens and you do more stuff in response to that. Mm. And before you know it, time has passed. And, you know, first it's the 25th anniversary and then it's the 35th and, and the publisher wants another edition of the book. Yeah. And uh, there's talk about reviving the, 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 in theaters and, you know, people on the internet call up, you know, send messages, are you going to be involved in a remake? And I say, there is no remake. That's, that's one that may not, you know, may never be remade. Yeah. At least not as long as Steven Spielberg is alive. Mm. So, uh, it, it is, uh, uh, it's, it's kind of astonishing to, to, to me to, to be part of something that was at the time a difficult job, but a job nonetheless. It wasn't even in my chosen genre. It wasn't even comedy, which was what I was used to doing. Uh, yeah. Was, nothing comic about it except the, what we put into it, which was human and funny and adorable and, and mm. uh, as much the work of the actors and the characters on screen and Steven Spielberg, who was the auteur who made the whole thing happen. Yeah. I was going to say, because Jaws is one of those movies that becomes a landmark movie. And even though so much of it kind of went wrong from production, you know, a lot of Obviously, the shark didn't work. That was really well documented. And obviously, just being able to film on the ocean as well was very tricky. But are you surprised that we're still sitting here 40 years later talking about it with such affection and still holding it in such esteem? Yeah, it, 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 uh, it is surprising. And I guess the people who were in Gone with the Wind and Casablanca and you know, Pick a Great Movie of the Past, I don't think any of them were aware they were making an iconic film at the time they were making it. Mm. Uh, I understand Wizard of Oz did not even succeed in its first release in the box office. It wasn't until it was re-released that it found an audience. So go figure. You, you, you try to do the best work you can and you hope that it will survive. And in this case, it did. Oh, it is. And since running the Daily Jaws, one of the things that's absolutely astonishing to me is the number of people say of, of our age and my age who were showing it to their kids even to this day and i was at yeah. a comic yeah. event recently and there were kids walking around with shark t-shirts and coming up because i was carrying a daily jaws sign around and they were just saying i love jaws all that kind of stuff so i think it's in a really really good place and people are still going to continue to love it and share it with their the younger generations because i think it's um i think it's just a really effective story but one of the questions that came up from from the uh the social media community stuff was Obviously, a lot of things went right with Jaws as well. Obviously, fantastic writing, amazing editing, great direction, perfect casting. But do you think there's any one particular element that makes Jaws stand out and it's given its longevity? Or do you think it's a combination of everything? No, it's, it's clearly a combination. 
as they used to say in the aspirin ads, you know, a combination of medically proven ingredients, a combination of entertainment proven ingredients, uh, you know, brilliant direction and camera work, the, uh, the editing won an Academy Award, the score by John Williams won an Academy Award. I mean, those things are inseparable. Yeah. And that, that particular theme is probably one of the, one of the most recognized themes in movie score history. I mean, probably equaled only by Elmer Bernstein's uh, Magnificent Seven, the Western theme mm. there, and uh, Wizard of Oz. I mean, there are, you know, there are some iconic scores also, and certainly Jaws is one of them. Yeah, oh, absolutely. And, and the community, I think, would, would massively agree with that. Um, what did you think of the movie when you first saw it? Were you with an audience or did you have a private screening when you saw it? And, and what were your thoughts? Uh, my wife and I and Steven Spielberg, three of us, shared a limo down to the first paid preview mm -hmm. in uh, Lakewood in Orange County, which mm -hmm. was a theater selected for the demographics of its neighborhood. It was you know, kind of like mid-America. And it was the second paid preview. The first one was the night before in Dallas, Texas. Uh, they didn't bring the writer for that one. But the next day in Lakewood, uh, Stephen and uh, Allison and I went in, a, in the car to see it. And uh, it was uh, it was pandemonium. I mean, it was the... the, the uh, at one point, somebody got up and ran up the aisle, and, and Stephen said, "Oh, shit! There's a first walkout." It turned <laughs> out it was somebody who was, you know, had to throw up. He was sick from terror, and wow. he finished throwing up and came back to the theater to watch the rest of the movie. <laughs> we had no, we had no walkouts that night. Everybody yeah, I was going to say it's, it seems to be. I mean, it's been really released in the cinema a few times, and I've actually been to see it with a few people that have never actually seen it. And it still works as a film. It's still really scary. It still makes you laugh. And, and you, I think most importantly, you care about the characters as well. So I think, yeah. you know, it's still relevant. You can still watch Jaws with someone that's never seen it before, even in 2018. And they'll still understand it and they'll still take away the same thing. Um, but one really interesting question is one, um, one thing that I, I've talked to, about Jaws to quite a few people. And they all tell me a different answer when I ask them what it kind of means to them or what they think it's about. Obviously, when you're a kid, you think it's all about the shark and the blood and the guts. But when you revisit it as an adult, you kind of understand it's about the characters. Did you make any conscious choices to try and give it that sort of two-pronged story? Or were you kind of working with very tight parameters when you were writing it? Or did you just completely fluke it? What happened? <laughs> I, I, I think a lot of that is your know, post-game analysis when you're actually working on it, uh, you want to make the characters believable. Mm. You want to make the situations clear and understandable. You, you want to tell the audience what they need to know in terms of shark behavior. And, and, mm. and in that regard, uh, the actors are very helpful because you give them speeches in which they communicate information. Yeah. But it, it's, it's a combination. It's, it's a delicate balancing act of character, story, uh, involvement. Mm. Uh, and you, you don't aim for anybody. I mean, my purpose, and the reason I was hired in the first place was to make it human and believable and give it some comic context. And, have, and the local actors who were hired, many of whom were not professionals, mm. really gave us interesting, quirky uh, uh, non-performance performances. I think Polly, the secretary in the office, is a great example of a naive actor, uh, uh, of naive art. Uh, you know, like, she's not an actor, but, and she had a hard time with the lines, but, but she got them out. And consequently, she's immensely believable this, because she's not acting in a cinema style that's you know, dated by the time, by now. I mean, a lot of, you look at a lot of 40, 50 year old movies and the actors acted differently than, than they do now. And mm -hmm. technology has advanced. Uh, and we had, you know, three wonderful actors, sort of the principals and Lorraine Gary was brilliant. Yeah. Uh, empathic and, and caring and a real, you know, loving mom. And I was on location writing for these human beings, these people. I heard their speech rhythms 
when they weren't reciting lies, I heard them speaking, just talking like people. Mm. And the best dialogue sounds like people talking. And mm. good actors can memorize a line of dialogue and say it. And the illusion is that they just thought of it, that their character just blurted that out. And that, that's, that's the magic of actors. That's what they do. Yeah. And one of the things, um, cause I was re as I was researching for the interview, I came across an amazing quote from, um, I think it was Hitchcock, and he said, to make a great movie, you need three things, a script, a script, and a script. And if you can get those three things right. Yeah. In terms of the scripting of Jaws, because obviously everything about Jaws is so sort of tight and streamlined. You know, the story is, is, is a very streamlined story. It's a very immersive story. You, you know exactly where it's kind of going, and you go on this thrill ride. But obviously then you've got the characters that you need to draw in uh, that help draw people into the story to make it believable and ultimately make people care. Did you work with the actors um, and did they sort of do any improv around stuff or was it literally, that's the script, those are the lines, that's what you say? How did that kind of work? It depended. The, the three actors had three different, very different approaches. Richard was, uh, Dreyfus was an actor who learned his lines and spoke them as they were written. He didn't uh, go off book. Uh, Roy Scheider was a New York actor, kind of steeped in the method, and if he was feeling something, he would ad-lib, or he would ad-lib something in rehearsal and ask me if it was okay to, to say that, or more importantly, he would ask Stephen if it was okay to say that. Mm -hmm. And when we were in agreement, or sometimes even if we weren't in agreement, if it felt like the right thing, that's what we would do. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and Robert Shaw was another uh, actor who wrote. I mean, he was, besides acting, Robert Shaw was a novelist who published novels. He was a playwright who won a Pulitzer Prize for the band in the glass booth. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert Shaw knew his way around a script. Mm -hmm. And he combined the best of, you know, ad lib and, and uh, spontaneous creation along with a respect for the words in the text. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, if, if he had lived, it was one of those situations where if anybody had lived an effective line, it went into the movie, you know, and then there we were. Mm. There's um, a question, this leads on nicely to a question from uh, one of our followers on Twitter. This is from the Spielberg Chronicles, and uh, the, I'm going to read this exactly as they, they've tweeted it. They said, there is a saying, life writes the best scripts from reality. Now, the question is, are there any memorable moments from reality that somehow found their way into the daily evolving of the Jaws script? Or is there anything you directly plucked from the reality of the, the set and what was going on and it found its way into the script? Good question. Let me, let me think about that for a minute. Um, the, uh, the family scenes in the kitchen, the first, the first uh, Brody scenes in the Brody house were partly ad-libbed and partly scripted. The scripted ones were the lines that were necessary to give you an insight into the characters. Uh, and the ad-libs were uh, L Lorraine Gary, who had raised two children and was talking to her kids the way you talk, to, the way a mom talks to her kids and consequently very believable. So uh, those two things just fused into one reality. Uh, the same with the scene on the dock where Roy gets slapped uh, that's a very skillful actress uh, who, who played the part of the grieving mother, mm. Mrs. Kim. And uh, she was worried about you know, hurting Roy. And Roy said, no, go ahead. Just give, you know, give it to me good. And she yeah. did. And she really whacked him. And there were m multiple takes of that. And when he looked pained and, and, and hurt, he, he, he's really pained and hurt because he's just taken a smack in the face. Yeah. Uh, and, and also the character is feeling terrible remorse and, and, and guilt for his part in the cover-up. So uh, that's an example of you know, re reality and the, the script moment all kind of blending together. I, I think that's a really important thing there, though, that, that scene. I mean, it's one of my personal favorites, that and the scene when Brody and Sean are at the, the dinner table mimicking each other and stuff. And the thing I like about the scene with the, the slap is that it doesn't shy away. It doesn't just use the Alex Kintner death as a spectacular set piece uh, to show a bit of gore and a bit of blood. And obviously that scene is more about Brody and his focus and that amazing dolly shot. But it doesn't shy away from the aftermath. You know, it shows that these incidents are affecting real people in ways that will change their lives forever. And someone needs to be held accountable for that. And it's Brody that really is 
that's you know he's the one that's wearing the badge he's the chief of police he's the guy that needs to really take care of this problem and that's why i think that scene is so powerful and obviously lee frio who, who did it was absolutely incredible um but it's moments like that that i actually think give jaws its, its longevity beyond just being a fish film shark film you know and i think yeah, it's also, done. i, I kind of have to take exception about the, the, you know, the real life writes the best scripts if you've ever listened to people talk mm. uh, with an eye to making dialogue out of what they're saying, uh, you'll realize that human beings repeat themselves, are elliptical, uh, dance around the, the subject sometimes. Mm. And in dialogue, you don't have the luxury, unless you're doing a documentary, mm. of having people, you know, you can't trust that people will say the right thing in the right order. Yeah. Uh, so, so no, it re, you know, reality is, you know, if that was true, you just go out with a tape recorder and, and just transcribe everything. But, uh, and there was some of that. There was uh, a lot of uh, Shaw's dialogue was uh, from comments made by a character on the island named Greg Kingsbury, who was in some ways a model for yeah. the way Quint spoke. And Craig and, uh, and Robert Shaw uh, drank a lot together. And Shaw would pick up the Kingsbury isms. So there's a lot of Craig Kingsbury in Robert Shaw. Yeah. And Robert Shaw's performance. In in terms of the, the characters, was there any particular character that was easier to write than others, would you say? Or El Harder? No, they the uh the you you uh uh, alluded to it earlier when you talked about the, the economy of the dialogue and how it all moves right along. Mm. Uh, the guys, you know, they all kind of got it right. They, they understood what the purpose of the scene was. The storyline was quite direct. Mm -hmm. If everybody just said the words that were in the script, some of which had not been written the day before, a lot of the, a lot of the words came as a surprise to the actors when they got to the set. Uh, but being conscientious actors, they would memorize the words and say them as best they could. And being good actors, it came out real. Mm -hmm. uh, and when we had a, a, a relationship between Dreyfus and, and Shaw, which was kind of competitive and uh, pointed, uh, their off-screen relationship contributed a lot to the tension between them on screen. And it's been alluded to elsewhere. But, you know. Yeah. I have to ask. Uh, Sorry, go on. No, the, 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 uh, I think one of the reasons for the film's success is that, you know, reality is always just outside the frame line. You know, you, you have the feeling that if you turn the camera around, you wouldn't see, like, trucks and technicians and everything. You would just see more of the vineyard and more of the ocean, which was, of course, not true. But yeah. Spielberg is such a great director that you have such a perfect sense of place uh, that, and this is like a rule for movies. If you're watching a movie and you can't imagine what's behind the camera while they're making the scene, then that's a good movie because they've created a real world that you, the only world that you're inhabiting while you're watching the movie. Mm. And you shared a, a house with Spielberg, didn't you, while you were writing? Yes, yeah, we, we, uh, we, we lived together. We were housemates. So how did it feel when, this is a question from one of the followers on Twitter, and they asked, obviously you, well in the book, your um, character Meadows was, was quite a big part in the story. And then you kind of disappeared out of the movie. And obviously, did you, just, did you suggest that to Stephen or did Stephen go, you know what, Carl, we, we, we need you really to write more. So write yourself out of it. How did that come out? That is... Uh... I, I, I frequently comment that one of my most painful tasks as a writer was writing myself out of a script in which I was kind of a co-star. If you yeah. look at the release prints, not, not, not the new prints, but if you look at a, the credits on a release print of the original Jaws in 75, it's, you know, Roy Scheider, Richard Dreyfuss, Robert Shaw, Jaws, hmm. co-starring Lorraine Gary, Carl Gottlieb, and Murray Hamilton. I had equal billing with them because it was a big part. And it was one of the first scenes that we were filming was the scene in which we discover Ben Gardner's boat with Ben dead in the boat. And yeah. when we were filming, and it was a daytime scene and Meadows being the editor of the newspaper is present for the discovery of the dead fisherman. Mm. And while we were filming the scene, uh, I went over, 
I went over the side. I fell in the water with all, ca all three cameras running and a British documentary camera that was also there for that. I'll be honest, that's probably one of my favorite photographs in the Jaws look, just your legs going over the side of the boat. <laughs> hitting the water. And as I'm hitting the water, I'm remembering, you know, there are blue sharks in these waters. This is not, this is not a shark-free environment I am entering as I leave the boat yeah. on camera. So because I was a, a secondary character, they didn't have my wardrobe doubled, so they, they had to wait for me to dry out before they could do another take. And Stephen said, "You know what? We don't. I don't. Let's not waste the time. We can come back. We can do this another day. Let's let's move on." Yeah. And so we moved on. And as we moved on, and as the script was evolving, because it was changing every day, mm -hmm. I realized, you know, it's. I don't need to be there. And Stephen's notion of doing it at night with just Brody and Hooper mm -hmm. on the boat, uh, as it turns out, gives us one of the biggest the biggest scream in the movie, mm -hmm. and a wonderfully tense. Uh, moment, which was, you know, by movie magic, started on the ocean and then the, finished on, on the lake on the back lot at Universal Studios at night with just a lot of smoke machines. And, 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 uh, <laughs> yeah, I remember when, um, when we first met in 2015, Joe told a great story about the scene where the crew have just finished drinking and then the shark starts to ram the boat. And apparently that was just a bit of wood that Joe had built on his driveway Spielberg kicking it and Joe running a hose down the side of it. I couldn't believe right. this was yeah, great filmmaking. <laughs> it's great. There, there, there are more than one moment in that film that was shot, you know, way after the fact, you know, in kind of impromptu situations. The head coming up out of the hole in the boat was filmed in the editor's swimming pool in a little house in, in, in Van Nuys. I heard they put um, carnation milk in the pool or something to make it look murky. Is that a or something? half gallon of milk just to give the water some, because the water in the pool was nice and clear because the pool filter was working, but in yeah. order for it to work photographically, it had to be a little cloudy. So they just <laughs> poured a gallon of milk into the water. <laughs> Absolutely, got the, got the effect they needed. Anybody can make yours. That's all you need is a carton of milk. Yeah, and you know all the secrets you need. That's milk in the water. Wood in the water. Got a question from uh, Food Gigolo seventy six from Twitter. Um, now, obviously, one of the biggest lines in the movie is "You're going to need a bigger boat," and we've heard a few different versions of how that line came to be. So, what's your recollection of how that came to be? I, I have a very mixed recollection. For years, I thought that Roy ad libbed the line, and I didn't want to take credit for it. There was even a campaign that the Writers Guild of America undertook where they bought billboards all over LA, LA with classic lines like, you know, it's the beginning of a beautiful friendship and what we have here is failure to communicate. And they wanted to use, going to need a bigger boat because it was already an iconic line. And I said, yeah, I'm not comfortable taking credit for that because I think Roy ad libbed it. Then years later, somebody pointed me to a documentary that's, that I believe is on the additional materials on the Blu-ray DVD where Roy says, no, no, that was in the script, that was written. Mm. So if it was in the script, I, you know, it was probably me that wrote it because, you know, Sackler's script uh, didn't have any reference to that. So, so, uh, uh, so that was written. But Roy and, 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 uh, and Joe kind of amplified on that off screen that, yes, that's, that was written, but it was based, it was like many things that appear on screen, it was reality based in that the working craft that accompanied the, the orca to sea every day for filming, where we stored the cameras and the lights and, you know, all lunch and all that stuff, that was a ragtag mess. It was called the, the SS garage sale because it was just mm -hmm. a floating pile of crap on a barge that had to be towed out to the location. And the producers, Zanuck and Brown, were incredibly stingy. They were very selfish bastards. They didn't want to spend a lot. And everybody told them they were going to need a better support boat for filming on the water. And they resisted. And the line, we're going to need a bigger boat, showed up in the dialogue. And it became a catchphrase on the set for whenever anything went wrong. If a light fell over or something fell in the water or, or somebody, you know, lost a sandwich, you know. They, they would say, you know, we're going to need a bigger boat because we did. We needed a bigger boat. And then when it became 
hyper evident from the production staff to the producers that they needed a bigger boat. They finally rented the boat that they should have rented from the beginning of the film, which was an ocean going, a big major ocean going tug, a work boat called the, uh, the, light, the Lightfoot, the White, the White Foot, I think it was called. Uh, uh, and and they, that's, that's the boat. Lynn Murphy was the skipper. And he was, uh, and once they got that boat, then, then shooting went more smoothly because they had the actors had a place to have lunch and get out of the weather. Uh, they, could, they could rest between takes. The boat itself could be used to shelter the picture boat when, when you know, the picture boat would be put in the lee of the, uh, of the work boat. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so, yeah, we needed a, we always needed a bigger boat. Scheider said it apparently in a number of different takes and under different situations, but that's the one where it made the, the highest impact, and that's how it became an iconic line. Yeah, so that's just... the, from my recollection, and 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 what I put together over the years talking to fans, because you guys, you Ross, and all your friends, and those of us, those who are watching. Mm -hmm. You guys know the film a lot better than I do. I've never watched it, you know, frame by frame. And there are people out there who have. Yeah. Is there, um, do you think uh, in that movie, not more maybe from a writing point of view or, or just an experience point of view, is there a, a particular moment that stands out to you and you think that's, I've nailed that, that's probably the best moment in the movie for me from a writing perspective? There's a couple of like purely scripted moments that were shot as written and delivered the goods. Uh, we've talked about the Alex Kintner scene on the dock, yeah. uh, starting with the ad-libs and, and the uh, me ad-libbing directions to the other, uh, to the extras who had gathered and the actors who were playing the fishermen who caught the, the, the fake shark. Mm -hmm. uh, not the fake shark, but the mistaken the, the, shark. The real shark, the tiger shark, yeah. Yeah, uh, uh, that, that scene I love because the first part of it is ad-libbed and then when Mrs. Kintner appears, it's right cues to the script perfectly and is an effective moment. And the other one is the moment out by the billboard when Dreyfus and Scheider, having found <coughs> Ben Gardner and, and go to tell Murray Hamilton he really has to close the beaches. Mm. And, and again, Spielberg's direction is just perfect. It's one long take. It starts as a master and then becomes a two shot and a single on, on a Dreyfus and then widens out again to include the billboard. Uh, it, it's a great scene and it's absolutely word for word what I wrote. Mm. Even to the point where Dreyfus could not pronounce Carcarid and Carcarius. I was going to ask you about that, yeah. <laughs> and, he, and he did it in looping. That line is, is replaced in ADR, in automated dialogue. Oh. He I I'd, I'd heard a story um, that he had it written out phonetically on a card. So, because when he says it, he he looks down, I think, and he he just looks away from the scene a little unnaturally. You don't really notice yeah. it unless you know that story. So apparently, he's got a card yeah, or something. I, I, I don't know that he had it on a card. I was there that day, so it's hard. It's hard to remember. Mm. But uh, I think he just got it. He just couldn't say it right, and yeah. rather than keep, you know. Doing a, you know, wasting time doing another take. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, you know, this is one of those moments that the script supervisor comes over since he's not he's not saying it right, and Stevens on never mind, we'll fix it. You know, we'll fix it in post, post. So, which we do. Yeah. I was, in terms of the the shark research, because obviously there was quite a lot of scientific stuff, and it explains sort of how sharks attack and and things like that. Was that stuff that you researched just from books, or did you speak to um, some experts about that? Um, both. I, I, I talked to some people from Woods Hole, uh, Leonard Campagno, who gets the screen credit for his technical consultancy. I read his books and other, I, I read a lot, just about all that there was to read about sharks. Mm. I did miss a book called Shark, the Killer of the Sea, by somebody named, uh, I think, Pete Helm. Anyway, the book was published in 62, and two of uh, Quint's lines in the Indianapolis speech, which began with Howard Sackler, have their genesis in that book. Sackler found the book and 
cribbed some dialogue, some some situations from it, mm -hmm. and, and, and interpolated interpolated them into his script, which yeah. then I worked on and, and then Shaw worked on. I've got a question about um, Harold Sackler because I think you know there is a lot of unsung heroes in in Jaws. You know, behind the scenes, a lot of people did some amazing work. And from what I understand, Howard Sackler did some work, as you say, on, on the, an initial script. Um, but didn't want any credit or anything like that publicly because he didn't feel it worked well, enough. What, what, what happened was uh, when they bought the book, one of the conditions of the sale was that Peter Benchley would write the screenplay. It was a way of giving him more money without going into the rights uh, and, and purchase money. They could pay him another couple hundred thousand to write a screenplay, and that would count in his compensation package mm -hmm. and then and he would have the, the fun if you call it that of writing the screenplay of his own novel which he did and he was not a screenwriter and it was not a workable script mm -hmm. so Zanuck and Brown went to Howard Sackler who was a Navy guy who had written Grey Lady Down and The Great White Hope he won prizes so he, he was a good working screenwriter and he wrote a very serviceable ad adaptation of the novel that included a lot of the events from the book, the affair between Brody and Hooper, uh, Ellen Brody. <laughs> Brody and Hooper. Was that the original script? And you, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, he, he found uh, the Indianapolis incident and interpolated it because in the novel and in the Benchley script, you don't know why Quint is monomaniacal. Yeah. It was Sackler who said, no, no, we need a reason for that and put it in the script. But he also put a lot of other stuff in the script. And the characters were kind of cardboard. It was a, it was a serviceable script, but it was, um, you know, I don't want to, in case Sackler's heirs are watching, mm -hmm. it, it, it wasn't hack work, but it was just, it was a routine, you know, popcorn picture, the way he wrote. And yeah. that's the script Stephen wanted to shoot. And that's the script Stephen sent to me with a note on the cover saying, eviscerate it. This is when I've been hired as an actor, but not yet as a writer. Right. And I wrote a long memo with a lot of suggestions, some of which were true and some of which were useless. But he showed the memo to Zanuck and Brown, and then they said, well, let's have him in here. Let's talk. So we did. And they said, can you do a rewrite on short notice? I said, yeah. And they said, well, we start shooting in three weeks. Stephen's going to Boston to cast extras and then to the Vineyard, yeah. and you know he's not going to be in LA. And you need to work with the director. So can you? We make this was on a Sunday afternoon. So if we make an offer on Monday, can you leave on Tuesday? And I went home and discussed it with my wife, and we said yes. And sure enough, that two days later, as I was on a plane with Stephen to Boston, uh, we were trying to get Richard Dreyfus. We didn't have him set yet because in in the the Sackler script. The obvious casting choices were Charlton Heston as Quint, and Jan Michael Vincent as Hooper, uh, and or maybe Lee Marvin as Quint, which would have been interesting. Yeah. Uh, but it wasn't the movie that got made. Mm -hmm. So uh, Sackler, uh, I remember during the beach scene, uh, David Brown approached me and said, you know, Carl, we're thinking of giving you a share. You know, you've been working so hard on the script. Because I was hired originally to do a one-week dialogue polish, and that turned into rewriting the whole movie with Stephen. Wow. And they said, well, we'd like you to offer you a shared credit with Peter Benchley. So I said, okay. you know. And, and uh, then I prepared for an art, a Writers Guild arbitration in case Howard Sackler wanted screen credit, which he was certainly entitled to ask for. Hmm. Uh, and to this day, we don't know if an arbitration would have awarded him a shared credit. But he chose not to take a credit. I, I think he probably figured that the film was not a faithful adaptation of his script. You know, Stephen didn't shoot the Sackler script. Mm. So he just said, you know, go with God, and uh, the credit is as you see it on the screen. Yeah. Screenplay by Peter Benchley and Carl Gottlieb, which is the chronological writing order, mm -hmm. based on the novel by Peter Benchley. So, yeah. Cool. Well, that's uh, fantastic. <laughs> Um, a question from um, Ashley Senior from uh, on Facebook. Uh, she would like to know if you could change anything about the film. What would you change, if at all? Well, you you know you really don't want to tamper with something that 
that turns out to be perfect. Well, you know, it wasn't perfect when we watched it uh, the, the first time. And you know, there are whole websites devoted to bloopers and, you know, uh, continuity errors. Mm. That would have fixed a lot of those. Mm. Uh, Dreyfus should have shown up in his first entrance driving the boat that he drove later when they went to look for Gardner, because where did he get the second boat from? We don't know. Uh, uh, <laughs> but, you know, things like that. I would have, I, I would, I would have liked to have smoothed all of those things over. I mm -hmm. would have liked to have shoot the uh, the the autopsy, uh, the morgue scene, mm -hmm. could have been done a little better. There's a very awkward edit in there. Yeah. But, so this is what happens. I think is the line. Yeah, it's a little yeah. bit odd, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, and it's just an awkward edit. There's, there's you know, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just, just, just how it came out. Mm -hmm. um, but. Like everything else, like like a lot of, I, I don't want to call it a great work of art, but uh, it's a great movie. Like all great movies, uh, you know, you don't, you, you can't pull on a thread without the whole thing unraveling. So, mm. it, you know. I, to tamper with would be it. tricky, yeah. Here's a question, um, again from Facebook, from Miles Flora. Um, were those little paint-happy bastards ever caught? No, no, they were just. The, <laughs> I, I, I can. I, I would surmise if I was going to write backstory, I would say it's the same kids who were karate chopping the fence in uh, <laughs> in, in town. The poly was and, and the shopkeeper were complaining about. Yeah, it's, it's probably those that little Funny. gang of malicious kids. And Spielberg has a soft spot in his heart for gangs of malicious kids. I mean, the Goonies <laughs> and ET. You know, he he. Uh, uh, he, he identifies with them. And yeah. He, they're, they're in a lot of his films. Yeah. So, you know, if we had had another, you know, two months to shoot, we kind of probably could have written some material for the Little Paint Happy Bastards, but it would have been a <laughs> distraction from the story. Sounds like a good pop group or something, isn't it? The Paint Happy Bastards. <laughs> in what film do Paint Happy Bastards appear? In it, number one. Um, here's a question um, from Gordon Don Wales from Instagram. Um, Ellen and Hooper's affair and the mayor's backstory with the mafia was left out. Was there any particular reason why and whose decision was that? Um, that was a, a joint decision by all of us who were concerned with the story. It was a needless distraction. It was fine for the, for the novel because in a novel you can take time out for digression and B stories and C stories and parallel tales. Mm -hmm. But in a film where you really are going from A to B to C, and in a, and especially in an action or a horror film, where you really don't want to take time out for, <clears throat> for peripheral nonsense, mm -hmm. uh, we decided, you know, very early decided to junk that. Mm -hmm. and so the, the casting was very instrumental in that. You could not imagine... Uh, Lorraine Gary and Richard Dreyfus having a torrid affair to get back at her husband. That, that just wasn't the relationship of the people that we saw on screen. Mm. And it would have been an extremely false note uh, mm. to even consider it. We, it was in the script when the, you know, on the first few days of shooting that was you know, among the scenes that remained to be shot that some of those were in there. But we said, you know what? Do, what, do we want to take time out to do this stuff? Or the only benefit that we could possibly have is when they are at sea forced to cooperate against the common enemy that the sexual tension of uh, Brody having been cuckolded by his mate on board the, the boat on which they both are depending for each other's survival, that would have added a nice tension. Mm -hmm. But to get that little bit of tension we would have had to do this whole backstory about the affair, and, and that was, that was we thought, pointless. So yeah. out it went, and so did the, uh, the mayor's, you know, mayor's concern was the welfare of the town's economy. That's what, why he was elected. He's clearly a booster and a pale fellow well met. Yeah. Uh, who makes the wrong choice, and, but as he says with great guilt, I was just trying, I was just thinking of the town. Mm. 
No, I think I think again, it it was the right thing to do. Again, keep it streamlined, keep it focused on you know that that objective yeah, of yeah. just killing the shark. Um, here's a good question. Obviously, Jaws is not just a great movie; it's one of the great scare movies and a very frightening movie. Um, did it scare you to stay out of the ocean, or do you not? You not preconceived and worried about that? I, I don't worry about it because I did the research. I know how few shark attacks there are in, 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 in real life. Yeah. And I'm not going to wear a wetsuit so I look like a seal, and I'm not going to go swimming off Cape Town or you know, New South Wales or Australia or any place where there are a lot of big white sharks. Yeah. So, uh, no, I, I'm not an ocean swimmer. I don't like the ocean. You know, but uh, I, if I go in the ocean, I don't think about sharks. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 never, I don't worry about them. And for everybody out there, don't worry about sharks. Your chances are much greater of being hit by lightning. Many right. more people are killed by lightning every year than are bitten by sharks. You heard it here first. Okay, thank you. That's brilliant. Um, in terms of scary movies themselves, what, what do you think makes a good scary movie? And, and what is your favorite scary movie if you had to choose one? Uh, what makes a good scary movie is... Uh, when you are personally involved and invested in the characters and you are shocked or dismayed or surprised by what happens to them, mm -hmm. sometimes in a way that you can predict, you know, no, don't go up. He's up, he's up there. He's got an act. Or, or when they go upstairs and the guy appears with an axe and you go, Oh, I didn't even see that coming. Uh, so in, there's elements of surprise. Uh, one of Hitchcock's master strokes was casting a movie star in Psycho who gets killed in, you know, in the first 20 minutes of the film. Because an audience that goes to a film doesn't expect a leading character to be killed off. So when Janet Lee gets stabbed in the shower, it's you know, doubly shocking and, and uh, unexpected. Plus, it's a beautifully filmed scene and graphic and all the, all the other things. Yeah. So, uh, the, the elements of a, a good scary movie are your involvement in the characters. You kind of have to believe that the characters are real and that they're behaving as best they can, and that the threat and the terror and the uh, physical harm that they suffer is um, you know is unexpected when it happens and motivated. Uh, even if you have to invent, you know, backstory for Jason or Freddy, uh, uh, you have to have a a not a plausible villain, but a, a scary villain who, you know, even if you know that they don't exist like that, they could, they might exist like that, and and, and that consequently is doubly scary because oh my God, there but for the grace of God go I, you know, chomp. <laughs> well, just going back to like the, the shower scene in Psycho, I mean, you say Janet Lee gets killed pretty early on. One of the things that really shocked me as a kid was um, when Pippet and Alex Kinter died, because I'm thinking, if a dog and a child can die within two minutes of each other, all bets are off. Anyone can die in this movie. And I'm like, who's going to be next? So that, for me, added to the tension. I thought that was... Well, some, of the under, under, some of the underwater shots of the swimmers, uh, we would laughingly refer to them as... The menu. <laughs> the menu, very good. In which the shark made, made his or her selections. Yeah, no, fair, no, fair point. Um, in terms of, uh, this is a, a question from, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right, uh, Lozimus Prime, I think it's from Instagram. Uh, she would like to know, what is your most treasured memory while working on Jaws? Uh, my, my most treasured memories are not much to do with the actual filming, but the camaraderie and the sense of purpose in the log cabin, which was the house that Stephen and I shared. Uh, Verna Fields' son was Stephen's personal assistant. He lived in a, in a small room in the attic, and there was a, a film student named David Ansbach who also stayed there for a while. Mm. But, the, uh, but every night, we had, a, we had a housekeeper who would make dinner for us every night because one of the distractions on location is, you know, you finish shooting, you watch the dailies, where are we going to eat? You got to find a restaurant, you got to go there. You know. By having 
a place to live and meals prepared, we were spared all of that. So here's this little warm little cocoon of a house with a typewriter and a desk at one end of the living room where I was working, and two bedroom wings and a, a big dining room table. It was, you know, sitting around the table either at breakfast getting ready to, for the drivers to come and take us to, to work or at dinner after the dailies sitting with Verna Fields and the producers and, and maybe one or two of the actors and Stephen and myself and just talking about what we had done that day, what was left to be done, how did the day's work affect the work that was coming uh, coming up because we were shooting out a sequence. And that that sense of being in a lifeboat together, you know, just it's just us trying to make this movie. And I, I, I treasure that collaboration. There was um, a lot of stories around Steven Spielberg basically quitting on like a monthly basis, saying he's had enough if he can't do this or, or whatever. Did you ever feel like just walking away from it at any point? Because obviously it was a really tough shoot and it went on much, much longer than anyone anticipated. There was all kinds of problems. Did you, did you ever think, well, I'm done? Or did you say, no, I'm, I'm in it for the long run? No, I was in it. I was in it to be in it. I, you know, I, was, I was in it to win it. And I was fortunate in that when the dialogue scenes were all shot and all covered from every angle and there was no more dialogue to be shot, I was done. You know, I, I wasn't writing shark swims left to right. I wasn't writing uh, <laughs> he fires the harpoon at the shark. We knew he was going to do that. I mean, I, I did write a line like that, but it, it wasn't up to me to, to be present for that. So I got to go home in mid-July. Uh, yeah. And and uh, they had to then <coughs> the three principals and the boat and the shark had to stay until yeah. they were almost finished. So they were there for another two months. Yeah. So I, I got out early. So I didn't have to have anything. <laughs> I had no reason to walk away. Everything I was doing was was being filmed because the beauty of doing a production rewrite on location is that there's no time to rewrite you by anybody else. Nobody else is going to write. Yeah. Maybe an actor will ad lib around a scene, but you know, I can trust the director to see the value in the dialogue as written or to see a better version of an actor ad libs it and put that in the movie. But yeah. like I say, I, 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 I never had to turn my back on. I was, I was there. To, I came to play. Yeah. No, and, I, and we're all glad that you did because it's obviously, you know, the community of the Daily Jaws has grown so much and it always comes back to just those human moments. And I think a lot of that's down to the, the writing and the collaboration between you and uh, the actors and, 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 you know, the whole crew, it seemed like, you know, it was a real sort of team effort, which is obviously the way it should be. Um, we've got a few minutes left before the hour is up, believe it or not. So I'm going to ask a couple of more questions um, before we wrap up. So one of the questions that I actually really like the look of, if I can find it. Um, okay, so this is a question from Scott Worthington uh, from Facebook, and he said, if Jaws was made exactly the same way, but with, say, today's technology, do you think it would have been as successful, or do you think because they used the technology they did, it, it really makes it a timeless classic? Uh, excuse me. Oh, intruder. <laughs> Say hello. Who is this? Um... <laughs> <laughs> Excuse us. Um, uh, say the question again. Yeah, so uh, Scott Worthington from Facebook wants to know, if Jaws was made exactly the same way, but with today's technology, do you think it would have been as successful? If the director and production designer and the producers all felt that there was just enough of the shark in the movie, mm -hmm. yeah, you could remake it. Yeah. It would be, having a, a, a CGI shark would have made some of the work a lot simpler mm. and, and easier, but uh, that wasn't the case. I mean, the film was shot before CGI, before uh, you know visual magic. Mm. If if you had all those tricks, it would have been a different film. We would have we if we had the, the ability to show the shark doing whatever we wanted it to do. Uh, you know, if you wanted the shark to tip a top hat and do a tap dance, you know, the shark could do that. Mm. So uh, <laughs> you wouldn't make the movie the same way. You would use a lot more shark. Yeah. And one of the values of the film is withholding 
the villain until it's absolutely necessary. Yeah. So, no. You know, the, the, the answer is that you, you, would, you wouldn't remake it the same way with CGI. You know, it would be, it would be silly. Yeah, so many people are against um, CGI sharks, particularly. And I think there's actually a real fondness for Bruce. He's almost seen as like a, the fourth cast member. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Sort of like, and, and, and he's really, you know, 25 foot of steel and plastic and fiberglass and paint and, and mm. uh, constant touching up. Yeah. Um, although I, the, the Shallows was a pretty, and, and was a pretty good, uh, some, I'm told, see, good, see, I haven't seen it, so. I, I there thought it was pretty good, yeah. There's pretty some CGI sharks where they've been valid, you know, where, where, where they didn't interfere with the, the story. Mm. And that's that's the whole point. You don't, you know, the problem with special effects movies, you get caught up in the effects and things are doing things that they can't do in the real world where there are physical limits. Uh, and all the monsters and, and transformer type creatures mm. uh, can't exist in the real world and, and throw throw cars around and, and walk over the cities. Yeah, but I think that Jaws is sort of grounded in that realism, is it? Because of the creature that, that it is, I think yes. you know a lot of what's actually in Jaws is scientifically possible. You know, there's a little bit of dramatic and creative license, but I think. Majority, actually, it's it's very very accurate. The shark experts that I've spoken to have said um, that actually, you know, yeah, it is actually very very accurate. Um, okay, so we're into the last couple of minutes because on a live feed it cuts out after an hour. Um, so the last question is, and this is actually one of my personal ones: um, working on a film like Jaws that's very very challenging. What did you learn from it? What did Jaws teach you? Uh, Jaws taught me that if everybody focuses on the job at hand and kind of uh, suppresses the demands of ego gratification and uh, showing off and uh, as long as everybody puts the project first mm -hmm. and everybody's first priority is to tell the story, yeah, that's the most valuable lesson there is. If everybody just works on making the best movie they can, mm -hmm. which is what happened. Every, you know, people were grumbling and griping and people wanted to get off the island and they were getting location fever. And, uh, but ultimately it was a professional Hollywood crew. And it's mm -hmm. kind of the tail end of the studio system. I don't think you could assemble a band of professionals like that again for anything less than a $150 million picture. And Jaws was a routine studio picture, and all the departments did their jobs, and all yeah. the workers. Yeah, and it's, it's really clear to see that everybody, even though a lot went wrong, it really raised the game for a lot of the crew to really give it their best. Yeah. Carl, um, we are in the final 45 seconds before we sort of get cut off by the gods of Instagram, but I just wanted to say thank you so, so much for taking time out. Obviously, today is the 43rd anniversary of the movie, so it's not just a big day for Jaws, but it's a massive day for, for you as well. Um, and so many followers have been commenting about what an amazing film it all is. Any final words in the last 20 seconds before we disappear? Uh, just it was great fun to do, and my book, The Jaws Vlog, is still in print, available wherever books are sold, both here and in the UK. And worldwide, Amazon, mm -hmm. The Jaws Log by Carl Gottlieb. Worth, worth a read. What we'll do is we'll put a link up on our Twitter and all of our platforms. Okay. okay, we've got a few seconds. Carl, thank you so much. Guys, 